Good afternoon, everyone. And apologies for a little bit late start, but uh, very, very glad everyone is here. My name is Furuzan Golshani, and I'm the Dean of the College of Engineering uh, that hosts this uh, event. It's a, a twice a year event, and the topics that we select are the current uh, societal and engineering topics. And uh, generally, we try to balance it with multiple views, uh, uh, definitely engineering, business, policy. And uh, today's topic uh, is one such topic. Uh, generally, uh, as you know, engineering uh, relates to everything that improves life, human health, happiness, and safety, and of course, uh, environment is a big part of it as well and we're uh, pleased that we have this opportunity to discuss a topic that is that cuts so closely to us uh, there was an upsurge of registration uh, this past week and uh, uh, glad that the room is full but uh, I was told that the events of last week had something to do with it the mudslide and the rain and so on well I'm here to say the organizing committee, the college, we had nothing to do with that. That wasn't us. That was way above my pay grade. Maybe some other higher powers did something, but it wasn't us. That wasn't a publicity stunt. So uh, this, uh, these lectures are organized by a subcommittee of the Dean's Advisory Council, Engineering Dean's Advisory Council. I'm very grateful to the uh, organizing committee whose members are present here. Uh, they are uh, Matt Petrim, the chair of the committee. Uh, Kent Peterson is here, thank you. Chris Hernandez of Northrop Grumman, uh, he will be here uh, later. And Mike Nigley, these are the uh, organizing subcommittee, members of organizing subcommittee. There are several other uh, members of the council that are present here today. Uh, Hal Snyder is here, Mike Bagramian, and uh, Bob Spidell. Thank you for your uh, participation and for your contributions. I'm very pleased to introduce to you our uh, provost, uh, Dr. David Dowell, who will welcome you formally on behalf of the university. Uh, Dr. Dowell has been our provost since tw uh, July 2013, and before that he was vice provost, and he's credited for uh, the great, a great deal of success that we have had in the area of student success, completion rate, and improving uh, quality of education in this university. Please welcome Dr. David Dow. Thank you, uh, Forzan. Um, and on behalf of California State University Long Beach and President Jane Connolly, and the Division of Academic Affairs, I am delighted to welcome you to our university for this, what will be wonderful, very exciting and interesting event. I'm pleased that Dean Golshani made it clear that the College of Engineering is not behind El Nino, global warming and mudslides, because as every good conspiracy theorist knows, it's actually the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and that's going to be revealed today uh, in the remarks that we've heard. <laughs> But seriously, I am so impressed at what's happening in our College of Engineering. The number of students we are graduating with high value degrees is soaring. The number of students showing an interest in engineering is soaring. Uh, they put a lot of energy and effort into uh, student success in their college and it's really paid off. So I'm very impressed. And of course we're filling important regional and national needs for engineers to take those jobs, drive the economy in the STEM fields. So I'm very impressed and I really appreciate uh, the efforts of Dean Golshani and the faculty and the staff and the advisors of the College of Engineering. And I'm also grateful that they put on such sparkling intellectual events as this. And thank you all for being with us today. Thank you, Provost Dahl. Uh, really grateful for all the support you have given the college and the, whole, the entire university. And now uh, to start the program, I'm uh, pleased to introduce the Master of Ceremony for uh, today's event. He shakes his head, not to uh, say too much. I won't say much. Matt Petrim, uh, our own uh, graduate, uh, very, very successful vice president of a great company uh, in our neighborhood, uh, Applied Medical in Rancho Santa Margarita. 
many years of experience, multiple other degrees from uh, other great universities, USC and all, and uh, a wonderful friend of the university. Please welcome Mr. Matt Petrine. I too want to thank all of you guys uh, for being here tonight. Um, as everybody's mentioned, this is a very timely topic. Um, we're, we're very delighted and fortunate actually to have such a distinguished panel of, of experts with us tonight. Uh, I want to briefly introduce them uh, and then you'll see more of their bios and, and their accomplishments as they come up. Um, with us tonight we have Dr. Pamela Emsch. Uh, Pamela is the engineering fellow at the Northrop Grumman Corporation uh, based here in Redondo Beach, California. We have Mark Jackson, who's the meteorologist in charge. He, when I called him and, and uh, we were talking to him, he said he was the MIC. I didn't quite understand that, but now I, now I much have much better understanding. So he's the meteorologist in charge uh, at NOAA's National Weather, Weather Service, uh, based in Oxnard, California. Uh, we uh, also have Russell Boudreau. Russell's the vice president and senior coastal engineer with Moffett and Nickel, based here locally here in Long Beach. And finally, we have Kevin Bryan. Kevin's a senior principal geologist for Leighton Consultant based here in Irvine, California. So I just want to welcome them and, and thank them again for all being here tonight. Okay, that sounds good. Before I bring Pam up, because uh, Pam's going to start, I wanted to, um, before we got started, you know, I for one wasn't quite aware what, what El Nino characterizes. You know, I think a lot of people think it may be just a weather event. You know, the, the, past, the past events we had from last week, are they El Nino related? Um, I, I actually wrote down a few definitions here to make sure I, didn't, I, I got these correct, but I know, I know Mark and, and the rest of the panel are, are going to do a much better job than I can uh, explaining this, but it, 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 as I mentioned, it goes well beyond just a weather event. It's, it's a much more complex set of interrelated oceanic and atmospheric conditions. As defined by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, El Nino is characterized by large-scale weakening of the trade winds and warming of surface layers of the equatorial Pacific Ocean. So during this time, what, what, what we see are swings uh, in what's called the Southern Oscillation. And you see a flip in the tropical sea level pressures between the Eastern and Western hemispheres. So basically, this flip produces, uh, or, or sorry, the flip produces changes uh, in the atmospheric and Pacific Ocean that affects weather around the world. Warm ocean water piles up across the equator through the eastern and central Pacific. And the normal east to west trade winds break down and instead they start blowing west to east. And this change allows a moist and powerful jet stream uh, to carry storms across the Pacific that in some, in some strong cases produce well above average precipitation across the southern tier of the United States but it also will bring warmer weather across the northern part of the United States. Um, so it was much, it's much more than just a weather event. Uh, uh, it's actually a, a season. Um, and uh, you know, our wonderful four speakers are gonna explain a lot more than, than I can. So, so without further ado, I'd like to bring Pam uh, up uh, and talk. Pam was gonna talk about satellite technology and, and, and the technology behind gaining the observations that, that you guys see on the Weather Channel and, they're probably, they're, um, you know, all, all the imaging and that sort of stuff. She's going she's gonna to talk about, uh, uh, about the technology behind that. So, Pamela? Thanks very much, Matt. So I'm actually very pleased to be a part of this panel. I think, it, you know, obviously it's very timely. Everybody's hearing about El Nino now. Um, and um, we actually represent a whole suite of engineering disciplines amongst the panelists. So I think that's, that's really good as well. Um, and I'm happy to kick it off and start talking about satellite observations. Um, so when it, when it comes to satellite observations, actually the satellite observations are the primary source of information that goes into weather forecasting, first of all observing the weather, and then the weather forecast models. And that's why we want to include it in this, um, in this panel today. 
the um, this is this is where we used to be. So back in 1960, NASA actually launched the first satellite that was devoted solely to observations of weather, uh, and it had something on it that was kind of like a TV camera. Uh, and for the time, that was phenomenal, uh, but. When you think about it, I mean, that, that's actually relatively recent. And an important point to make is that there have been, um, since 1957, there have only been about six strong El Ninos. So we haven't actually had observations um, of, of a huge number of El Nino events and La Nina events and then uh, um, just observing the whole climate and weather system in a consistent way from satellites. Um, for a long, long time. And so it's something that we're still building on. It's still, it's, it's information that we're still building up. We're still learning a lot about how the oceans, the atmosphere, and all the parts of the weather and climate system interact. And satellites are a, a very, very important part of this. What we have now is actually an international system of layered observations. It's, it's really a system of observing systems. Uh, and so if you, if you start from the bottom, we have observations that are made on the surface, so ships, NOAA ships and other ships that go out and make observations. We also have weather balloons that are sent up, buoys that are in the ocean. There are also land-based weather radars um, that, you know, you can look uh, on the news, you see the Doppler weather radars, those are the NOAA weather radar system. Uh, and then up above that, we have actually airplanes that go up, there are low-level airplanes. And then we also have unmanned airplanes that can actually fly up above the, the storms. Um, Global Hawk is an example of one of those. Uh, and up above that, then we have um, the low Earth orbiting satellite systems. They're at about 850 kilometers, which is something like 500 miles. And then far, far up above that, we have the geostationary satellites at about 35,000 kilometers, which is something like 22,000 miles. There, there are other satellite systems and a few, or, or other types of orbits, and a few of those are used for looking at weather and climate as well, but, but, but the um, low Earth orbit and the geostationary are the two primary systems that are used. But it's, it's all these observations together and how they work together and sort of corroborate each other. We use the, the, um, the surface-based information, the buoys and so on, they actually are used to validate the satellite measurements and vice versa. And the same thing with the, with the airplanes. Sometimes we do airplane underflights under the satellite systems, and those are used to validate each other. So you really want this, this full set of systems. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's international as well. So there are data sharing agreements between the United States, for example, the European Union, um, Japan, other nations. Altogether, the, the, these observations give us global measurements. So all around the Earth, it's very systematic and repeatable. Um, and so it's useful for long-term monitoring of the climate and different types of weather situations, but also very quick monitoring of environmental hazards, including severe storms, um, tornadoes, um, and... and um, hurricanes, um, and, and all sorts of, of, of uh, um, st storms that are coming in to hit coastlines and so on. And then, as I mentioned, the, the ground truth, the in-situ ground truth is used to calibrate the sensors. So I'm going to give you a little bit of information on the two primary types of satellite systems. The first one is sun-synchronous satellites. They're polar orbiting. They're in a low Earth orbit. As I said, it's about 525 miles up. What these do is they actually, as, as the Earth is rotating, these satellites circle the Earth from pole to pole. So they just keep moving around the Earth. But any point at, that they're looking at on the Earth, um, they're always looking at the same time of day. So the satellite is actually in the same position relative to the sun. It's just that it, it, it comes around the Earth. So when you come back to the same spot, like, like Long Beach, for example, Anytime they come back and look at Long Beach, they're always looking at the same time of day. And that's very important because then scientists can, the, the sun conditions are not changing. So all the, the, the satellite information from day to day to day has always got the same sun angle on that location. And you don't get things like strange shadow effects or just um, effects that you get from looking at a different, looking uh, at that same point with the sun being at a different angle. 
Um, it's, it's especially, well, so it, it actually, they, they rotate around and you get a view of any location like Long Beach, you get a view during the day and a view during the night. And again, the same time during the day and then 12 hours later at night. And you build up a full Earth view that way. So you basically get a view of the entire Earth with the satellite in the day and you get a, a view of the entire Earth at night. This is especially, this satellite data is especially important for weather forecasts. Um, about something like 90%, I think, of the data that goes into the numerical weather prediction models that, that predict like your two day, three day, five day, and so on forecasts, about 90% of that data is satellite data. Um, and, and particular instruments on these satellites are especially important for that. So um, critical for that. Also, any studies of global phenomena, so the fact that you're getting a full Earth view uh, this data is extremely important. And an example of this is the ocean, ocean and atmospheric interactions and oscillation that are actually El Nino, uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation. Um, so watching these things over just multiple years in a global, in a global scenario. Uh, and then again, long-term climate observations and modeling. So very, very, very important satellite system. And there, and there are actually several, um, several of these satellite systems up there. So NOAA's got a polar orbiting satellite system. NASA puts up polar orbiting satellites. The European Union, other nations do this as well. This is an example of polar orbiting data. Um, this is the most recent NOAA um, polar orbiting satellite that was launched in 2011. And as I mentioned, this satellite goes around the Earth and it, 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 it's actually collecting swaths, ribbons of data basically. And then um, this particular satellite goes, goes around the Earth 14 times a day, and then you can basically stitch those together and get a view of the full Earth. And so you can actually see on this picture these strips of data. So each strip that you see there is one satellite pass. It actually, here it goes up to the top, and then it comes around the other side, and it's dark on the other side, and it comes around the, the South Pole, goes up, comes down like that. Okay, the next uh, type of satellite system is geosynchronous satellites. These are extremely high, so 20, 22,000 miles, whereas the polar orbiting satellites were at about 500 miles. So way, 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 way up there. And these actually stay stationary relative to the Earth. So as the Earth rotates, the satellite rotates around as well. So it's always looking at the same part of the Earth. Because they're so far out, they actually don't collect in strips like the polar orbiting one. They had they can view an entire half of the Earth, or basically it's about a third of the Earth that they can view. So, um, and the, for the United States, we we basically have two of these that NOAA NOAA um, procures and operates, and these are the the GOES satellites. There's one called GOES West, and there's one called GOES East. GOES East, GOES West is a little more over to over above the west coast of the United States, and GOES East is more over up above the east coast of the United States. So they're always looking down at the same part, same part of the Earth. Uh, and so they, they're basically getting continuous, a continuous look at that part of the Earth that they're looking at. Um, and they, they um, the, the, the LEO, the polar orbiting systems, you get a look about every 12 hours with one satellite. So you can take a look at Long Beach about every 12, 12 hours, once during the day, once at night. Um, with these, you, you, look in, you can take a look in less than, less than an hour. And in fact, if they're, if they're tasked by the weather forecast offices, if there's a severe storm coming in, then get information in minutes, minutes worth of data, like every minute. So to watch severe weather coming in. So even though they're that far out, they can actually get a very good, good look. Um, because they are so, so far up above, they have a little worse resolution than the polar orbiting satellites. But they've got this fantastic temporal resolution. So their data is very important for um, specific weather situations, for studies of weather in motion, for weather forecast watches and warnings. And here's an example of some of the data. I actually just pulled this off the web a couple days ago. And so this is actually uh, the view that the NOAA Goes West geostationary satellite gets. Um, and it's, it's as, as I mentioned, it's a little bit more over the West Coast. Uh, and then that information goes into the products that NOAA and other scientists and other organizations put up on their websites. So in this case, the information 
the infrared satellite data information was was um, put together by the National Hurricane Center, and we can actually see that um, there's actually a, a tropical uh, cyclone off the um, out in the Pacific Ocean. Okay, so a little more information on, on how the satellite and the systems work and how the instruments work. Um, what we start with is the, the user needs. So what is it that the National Weather Service, one of the primary users of this data, what is it the National Weather Service needs? Um, what do climate scientists need? Um, what do other organizations that are monitoring weather and environmental conditions need? And these are some, this is um, a selection of some of the type of data that is, that is useful and that users want. Um, so, and some of them I'll point out are, are especially interesting for studies of El Nino and the Southern Oscillation. So sea surface temperature is actually an indicator of, of um, potential changing and oscillating conditions in the Pacific. Uh, another one that's, that's interesting is um, clouds. So you, you get more convection, more moisture forming over parts of the Pacific and changing in parts of the Pacific. Also altimetry because the sea level height can actually change um, given certain conditions. Um, and wind speed and direction is another indicator of ch the changing situation in the, um, El Nino. Uh, other information that's very useful, I mean, it's not just, when we, when we think about using the satellite data, it's not just monitoring the conditions and trying to um, provide that data to scientists so they can try to determine, you know, is an El Nino happening? Um, it's, it's useful for, okay, if an El Nino has happened and maybe there's going to be some precipitation coming in, you know, monitoring that precipitation, the storm, so precipitation is, is another um, parameter that's of interest. And the other one is, is um, snow and ice. And so, you know, we've probably, you've probably heard some mention about snowpack building in the Sierra and will an El Nino, um, will that increase snowpack that could, that could help deal with the drought or not? Um, that's a question that the scientists and, and um, the folks at NOAA and the National Weather Service are going to want to answer. Um, but it's this, the satellites can monitor all those different types of parameters and give them that timely information. Okay, um, so the way that, that the, um, the systems work is they have a set of instruments on each satellite. And the satellites basically, um, the instruments observe electromagnetic radiation. So it's, it, it, it has to do with the radiation that's coming down from the sun, comes down, this is a very simple case here, but the radiation comes down from the sun, hits the surface. Here the example is grass, bounces back up. Um, we, can, we, we see some of these wavelengths of light with our eyes, that's the visible spectrum, so something looks like green to us, we're seeing certain wavelengths. But, the, but there are many more wavelengths in the electromagnetic spectrum, and the instruments that are chosen to go on these satellites are chosen to actually um, be able to detect these different wavelengths. So you can get much more information than just the color of something. You can get information on moisture content, um, uh, layers of things. This is a whole host of information. And while this radiation is coming down, it's actually coming down, sometimes it bounces up off clouds, comes through clouds, scatters around, comes down to the surface, some gets absorbed, gets bounced back. So it's a very complicated process. But the instruments are well chosen to try to look at all those dis different forms of radiation. Um, so so the, 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 depending on, on the information that's desired, by the users um, and by the agency that, that funds these. They choose the type of satellite they want. They're usually follow-on programs, so there's a whole system of polar orbiting satellites, and NOAA, for example, will procure the next series of those, or they're gonna procure the next series of geostationary satellites, and they, they do look at their requirements and their user needs and determine what type, of what type of instruments that they need on those platforms. Is it a continuation of what they have, already or would they change something for the next one? They choose the instruments um, and then ultimately the instrument measurements are translated into environmental data products like sea surface temperature, for example. This is actually a, a real life example here so you, so you can get a feel of the scale of things. Um, this is the SUMI uh, NPP satellite that was launched in October of 2011. It's the most recent NOAA uh, in partnership with NASA, polar orbiting satellite, it's, it's up there now, sending data down. 
you can kind of get a feel for the scale of this because you can see the guy down there. Um, looks kind of like he's holding the whole thing up, but it's actually fastened at the bottom end. Um, but it gives you a good sense of the scale. This, this particular satellite has five instruments on it, and you can see um, I listed the, the types of instruments here, but I've also listed the type of data products that each of these instruments collects. Um, so we have a, a visible IR instrument um, that does imagery and looks at, at what looks to us like the colors of things. Um, also sea ice, sea surface temperature, land properties. Um, the IR, the sounders actually give profiles, temperature and moisture profiles through the atmosphere. And that actually gives a lot of the input to weather forecast models. Um, it provides global data on the moisture and temperature information in the atmosphere. And these are things that can really impact the weather. And so having this global data to feed into the weather forecast models is really critical. The Earth Energy Balance Instrument actually looks at the radiation balance um, around the Earth, um, which is actually uh, um, important for a lot of things, but it's used by climate, um, climate scientists a lot. And then the ozone monitor monitors the ozone. And um, this is how it looks when you start to get ready to launch. First of all, I mean, it's, year, it's years in the making putting, putting the instruments together, building the instruments. There are a lot of different contractor companies involved. So for those five instruments, there were, there were three different companies that worked on the instruments and another company that actually worked building the satellite. There's another company that puts together the launch vehicle. But once the, once the satellite is put together on the ground, it's tested in great detail on the ground. They actually reproduce, try to reproduce the conditions that it would be facing in space, which are extremely cold and extremely hot. Uh, and then... Um, and then it's actually put inside a, like a capsule, which is basically called a fairing. It's a pod that then is going to go on top of the launch vehicle. So on the left, you can see the, the satellite there and a little guy down in the bottom right corner. Um, but the satellite's put inside the half the fairing, and then the other half of the fairing fits on that. And then the fairing, um, the pod is put on top of the launch vehicle, which you can see in the middle. And then you have propulsion modules down at the bottom. These are actually rockets with propulsion in to help it launch. And then it uh, lifted off early morning on October 28th, 2011. And this is actually a time-lapse photo. So this, this actually was launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base. Their satellites are launched from different locations depending on what orbit you want to place them in. Um, this at, you can actually see these launches from Vandenberg. I live in Redondo Beach, and I can stand on my porch and see um, the burners from some of these launches because they take off for some of these orbits, and, and this one was like this, they, they take off and then they actually head south kind of towards Santa Barbara and then go out over the ocean and start heading sort of south. And so you can actually see them, see the burners, some of the afterburners from here. It's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> cool for satellite people. <laughs> okay, so um, once the satellite is up, your job is not at all done. I mean, it's hard enough to build the instruments and the satellites and put them up uh, into orbit. Um, but then we've got basically ground command and control. So there's always commanding the, the basically the satellite is placed into orbit. So it's, it stays in that orbit with a little bit of station keeping, a little bit of adjustments. Um, but, there, but there's monitoring of the satellite and there's the data coming down. And then when the data comes down, it has to go into processing centers and it's turned into geophysical products, which again is a very complicated process. Um, let's see, so I have a, a few other examples. Um, you've, you've probably all seen pictures like this um, on the news and on uh, the Weather Channel and so on. A um, couple of hurricanes, so this is, this is taken with visible IR instruments. It's one type of instrument and you, you, know, you can see what looks like a lot of information here. Um, but what you really want to do is combine data from different instruments and different satellites together because they can all tell you something important. So on the top here, there's a, this is Hurricane Katrina. And on the top is prior to landfall. And on the left, you're really seeing the visible IR view. On the right, there's information that's coming from a microwave, microwave instrument. And microwave instruments give you a lot more information about the moisture content. So things like precipitable water, cloud liquid water, um, and just you want to use these together to give you the full set of information. At the bottom, you can see Katrina at landfall on August 29th. And again, um, just, just 
information on both from the top of these storm systems and also looking down into the storm systems is, is really important. Okay, an El Nino example. Um, as was mentioned, so, so El Nino is actually part of an oscillating phenomena. And it's, it's actually a global phenomena. This you see, you see uh, repercussions and interactions all around the globe, but we actually walk, watch things mostly in the Pacific Ocean, the South Pacific. Uh, and some of the parameters that are important to watch are sea surface temperature, the ocean winds, sea level, various atmospheric conditions, cloud formation, precipitation, and, and um, the satellites and other observing systems collect the data. And then scientists and, and, and the folks at the National Weather Service and the, and the um, Climate Prediction Center can actually put together this information and, and um, have basically plots of long-term averages. So they've got long-term averages of conditions over the Pacific Ocean, let's say sea surface temperature. And then if there's a particular um, year or uh, situation they're looking at, they can compare the current situation or a one-month average or two, three months most recent average to the long-term average. And that gives them an idea of if they're seeing some kind of, kind of anomalous condition. And by anomalous, I mean just, just is it, does it look extreme compared to the longer-term conditions? So you see on the left, uh, this was the most recent strong El Nino. And um, in this case, it's a comparison of the year for that El Nino compared to the long-term conditions. And um, there was, there was a, um, a large difference in sea surface temperature. So it was warmer than usual in the red areas. And then on the right is the El Nino condition, which is the opposite end of this oscillating phenomena. And here, the, um, in, during the La Nina year, the sea surface temperature conditions were cool compared to the long-term average. So that's the type of work that the, um, the NOAA and other folks look at. Um, this is the type of satellite information that comes to them. So this is, this is a, uh, a recent, a couple days ago, from the NOAA-LEO satellite system, polar orbiting satellite system. And this is just actually sea surface temperature. The prior one I showed was, was anomalies in sea surface temperature. This is actually the sea surface temperature. And my colleague here, Mark Jackson, is, I think, going to talk about if this is, how anomalous is this compared to long-term conditions? Okay, another good example is sea surface winds. Um, this is actually sea surface wind information from a European satellite called METOP. As I said, we do a lot of uh, data sharing, um, but this is another, another um, type of information that's monitored. And then I have a, I'm gonna finish off with a couple examples of, of nice imagery data. Um, this is uh, data from a NASA EOS satellite. It's visible IR imagery. And on the left, we have smoke off the California coast. This was, there were these uh, fires for those who were here in, two, in 2003. The Cleveland National Forest near San Diego just had huge problems. And down near Julian, um, the whole, whole areas of forest burned down. This was that time period. Um, and so, you know, satellites, monitor this type of information. I mean, this is good for actually assisting the National Weather Service when they're looking at um, fire weather monitoring. But also, we can keep monitoring burn scar areas. So now that some of these fires have taken place in Southern California, let's say over the last couple of years, we can monitor the burn scars. Um, and um, it's also there, these are areas to watch if, uh, if we do see precipitation events coming in. On the, on the right, this is an example of dust over the Yellow Sea between China and Korea. It's dust blowing from the Gobi Desert. And so these are, this is an example of aerosols, um, another critical parameter to watch. And, and trying to differentiate between clouds and aerosols when you're looking with satellites is an extremely difficult problem. Um, and especially if they're over snow, because things can look, they all kind of look white in a way. It's very important, and these are some of the parameters that actually climate scientists use in some of their climate models. So there's a lot of study going on in clouds and aerosols and how those can get represented in climate models and how much satellite data can help or, or could it be improved. And uh, um, just, I'm just uh, trying to give you an idea here of the resolution of some of this data. So this is imagery off the coast of Brazil that was taken with the, with the SUMI NPP satellite that I showed you the launch of. 
and I'm going to zoom in on the Amazon here. So the, the resolution of this data is, um, it, it ranges from about a, a quarter mile up to about half a mile. But, I mean, it's, it's just, it's absolutely beautiful data. I mean, when you compare this to what we had back in the 70s or even back in the early 80s, it's, it's phenomenal. And these things are improving as we go along. You know, you can see that you've got, you know, mud coming out from the Amazon, and then you see things that look like clouds. And again, and part of the skill here is to try to differentiate, you know, um, what's clouds, what's not clouds, what kind of clouds, are these, are these clouds with a lot of moisture in, is there going to be precipitation? And this is the type of information we want to, we do collect with the satellites um, and provide to scientists. So satellite observations have come a long way. Um, and it's a very good system that the United States has a wonderful system of satellites, multiple systems of satellites. Actually, NOAA and, and um, NASA provide their satellite data for free to basically everybody around the world. A lot of countries don't do that. A lot of countries don't have satellites. And the fact that we have global data is extremely helpful. But the challenge here is, um, first in the short term, ensuring the continuity of the satellite observations and the data. In the short term, when satellite's up there, we have a very good system of monitoring the health of the satellites. And so that's, that's, that's very good. We're always watching them, um, watching the data, and monitoring the instruments. In the long term, the challenge is that um, although weather is critical to everybody and, uh, and, and impacts um, you know, transportation, um, uh, I mean, every, every single system you can think of is impacted by the weather, right? And everybody's interested in it. But it's not necessarily a national priority, interestingly, when, you come, when it comes down to budget. So NOAA has to go in and fight for their budget. NASA has to fight for their budget. Um, and just getting the word out about how important the satellite observations is, are is very, very um, important. So I think that's that. And thank you very much. I'll look forward to questions. Um, thanks, Pam, for, for uh, sharing that wonderful, incredible uh, satellite technology uh, and the gathering of all the different information. Uh, I'd like to bring Mark Jackson forward. Uh, Mark and his colleagues take those observations, take the uh, take all that information and, and hopefully predict and, and help us prepare for what's coming. All right. Thank you, Matt. And uh, Matt mentioned earlier that I'm a MIC, and he's right. Um, if you weren't aware, NOAA stands for the National Organization for the Advancement of Acronyms. <laughs> so, so anyway, thank you very much for inviting uh, NOAA and the National Weather Service into this, uh, into this lecture series. It's great to be um, on campus here, and it's great to see a full house here with everybody with such an interest in, in, the, in what we have to talk about here. Uh, before we go any further, I just wanted to see a show of hands. Who was living in Southern California in 1997 and 98? Okay. So pretty much the majority of the room, I think, and I, I think a lot of you remember what it was like in 97, 98. You might have had your own personal experiences of of, uh, I've already heard a couple of stories from, from the speaking panel, but um, for those that, that were not here in 97, 98, which I can raise my hand, I was in Brownsville, Texas in 1997, 98, and I will say that the most common uh, picture that you saw of El Nino were, was houses falling into the ocean. So that's, and as we'll see with the next speaker, that's one of the, once one of the big impacts that, that, we'll, that we could potentially see. Um, I'm not going to give my exact forecast for how much rain we're going to get. Um, there's far too many cameras and far too many microphones and recording this, so, and iPhones are probably on. Um, but in any case, I'll, I'll hopefully give you an idea, better idea of what El Nino is, um, and from a National Weather Service perspective, what we are seeing, what NOAA is seeing, what is predicted for what this might mean for this winter. Okay, so just as kind of a basic, let's see, as a, as a basic, if we can answer the simple questions of what is El Nino. 
So El Nino, as, as, as Pam mentioned, it's actually an oscillation, as Matt mentioned in the definition. It was kind of interesting when, when Matt wanted to come up with a definition, a quick definition of what El Nino is, and I've been in those, that same kind of situation. We just did a media interview last week, and after telling him what it is and everything, the reporter goes, I need a definition that I can say in 10 seconds. So it's not that easy to say in 10 seconds. But we can at least go through some of the basic um, aspects of it in terms of uh, kind of an El Nino 101. So it's an, it's, a, it's an oscillation. It's the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO, and that's the warming phase of the equatorial Pacific. And then you also, though, must get this reversal of these trade winds that typically blow from east to west in a normal pattern. But in an El Nino pattern, they break down and they blow from west to east. And you need both of these working together because just because you have the ocean warming in the equatorial Pacific doesn't mean you really have an El Nino. You need those trade winds to break down to bring these storms to the east. They typically last nine to 12 months um, and whether we're talking about an El Nino or whether we're talking about a La Nina, La Nina is the cold phase, El Nino is the warm phase, typically lasts 9 to 12 months. And El Nino comes from, I'm sure a lot of you heard, that's the, the Christ, you know, uh, little boy, Christ child, um, as, these, as the waters off of Peru become very warm and you lose this upwelling, the fishing industry really breaks down when you lose this upwelling, it occurs around uh, Christmas time, so that's the El Nino, but you also get the La Nina, which is the next phase. They're classified officially as weak, moderate, and strong. And so you can have from one spectrum of a very strong, of a strong La Nina up to a strong El Nino. Now, lately now, coming into this winter, there's, there's one kind of camp out there that would like us to start classifying the very strong category. Um, of which we've had a couple within recent history. There have been six strong El Nino events since 1950, and 1950 is when they really started tracking these things, but they can also run numerical simulations and ensembles and everything, reanalyses to go back even further than 1950 to try to simulate what was probably going on before 1950. But 1950 is, is kind of the standard for the uh, measuring these phenomena. So El Nino typically brings above average rainfall to Southern California. The problem is, um, from a statistical standpoint, um, if you're a pure statistician and you are basing your forecast off of a sample of six events over the last 65 years, that's probably not very reliable, but it's, it's about all we have. But the signal is very strong, so we have that going for us. So I'm gonna show a loop here, um, and this is, um, this, is a, this would be a movie that shows sea surface temperatures. This is actually an animation created on the NOAA Science on a, on a Sphere. Um, there is a, it, if you haven't seen it yet, there's a Science on a Sphere down at the Aquarium of the Pacific in their, in their science room. Uh, it's full size. It's not one of the tabletop size. Really a neat um, exhibit that I invite you to see if you haven't. So this will be a quick movie that will show science, sea surface temperature anomalies. And remember how Pam was showing these anomalies? Well, there was... It's really, in science, we really live off of, it, off of anomalies. I mean, it's, even in terms of forecasting, we need to know, is it going to be colder tomorrow, warmer tomorrow? Is it going to be unusually cold, unusually warm, unusually wet? So normal is really kind of, um, it's sort of irrelevant. We like to speak in these anomalies. So this will be a sea surface temperature anomaly. You'll see reds and blues that will loop through from 1980 to 1999. And it really is pretty fascinating how this all works. And, and, and it's just showing how the, the ocean temperatures are constantly kind of sloshing around and balancing around. From a kind of on a simple term, the oceans in the atmosphere are constantly trying to balance the heat budget across the globe. If too much warm water piles up in the, in the equator, it tries to balance that out. If they have too much warm air at the equator, too cold, it tries to balance it out. That's why we have weather. Well, there is an ocean-atmosphere interaction. And so what's happening here, occasionally you'll see some bright red bars that'll stick out. Those are the El Nino events. And then they'll switch around, it'll become a La Nina, it'll become blue. And right towards the end here, you'll see 1997-98 uh, kind of flash out. So again, it's just, it's changing all the time, about every nine to 12 months. And uh, so there's 97, 98. So it really is a fascinating phenomenon. 
El Nino. And when you, when you think about how it impacts um, people everywhere around the globe. We have El Ninos bring droughts to Indonesia and to Australia while they bring excessive rain here in Southern California. La Ninas typically uh, mean dry for Southern California. But the last time we had a strong La Nina was 2009, 2010, and that happened to be the last time that we had above normal precipitation in Southern California, so figure that one out. Um, and, and we have had not, we have not had a strong El Nino since 97, 98. Um, as a matter of fact, though, we've had quite a few years of very dry conditions. And you remember 2004, 2005, um, we had 34 inches of rain downtown Los Angeles, which was much more than we, not much more, but more we, than we had in 97, 98. That was the only, that was uh, right before I got here in August of 2005. So, Somebody at work actually figured out that this has been the driest 10 years on record in Los Angeles since I've been here. So I'm hoping that, I'm hoping that, that trend is broken in this winter. So looking at it from a cross section, how it all breaks down with the El Nino and the trade winds. So this is a normal Pacific pattern. On the left here is Darwin, Australia. You're kind of taking a cross section looking north along the ocean surface. On the right is Lima, Peru. You get these trade winds that blow from east to west. A lot of the storms and the, and the convection builds up in the western Pacific. Well, in an El Nino pattern, that kind of shifts over. So now you get the, the storms and the convection move over more towards the central Pacific. You get this piling up of warm water in the central Pacific. And a very important part is, are these westerly trade winds that really help blow um, all these storms and, and everything off to the east. So this is um, on kind of a big picture schematic, what you typically see for impacts um, with an El Nino, wetter across the southern tier states, and not just Southern California, it goes all the way across Texas into the Gulf Coast and even some up into the Eastern seaboard, and then warm and dry up in Alaska and Canada. So here's the latest, um, and it's, it actually hasn't changed much over the last couple of months, but the ocean uh, continues to reflect sustained El Nino conditions. Uh, the forecast is for a strong El Nino to persist through the winter. I think you may have actually heard the number 95% has been throwing around. Now that's 95% chance that El Nino conditions will continue through the winter. That's not a 95% chance that we will have an El Nino storm like was reported on one of the media outlets, and so it's important to, dis to distinguish between an El Nino season and a storm. El Nino is a season of storms. It, all it means is that you have a higher number of storms within a season. But what we are seeing is that that will likely cool, which is typically what happens through the late spring and in, into the summer. And in fact, some of the projections show that we could actually bounce back into a La Nina next winter. So here's a sea surface temperature anomaly. Uh, this is actually the average from 2015, or from uh, uh, September through uh, last week. That black box, I'll point out, is called the Nino 3.4 region. And they break down, they break down the, um, these regions. There's one, two, three, four, and then this is the 3.4 region, approximate. And this is, this area, is used to really kind of go all the way back, you know, 1950, we're tracking what the temperatures are doing in this box on three month jumping averages or leaping averages. And I'll show you a chart here that depicts that. So we really want to monitor what the temperatures are doing within this box right here. But you see it's very classic El Nino pattern, the warmer waters off of South America, extending off to uh, off the Central Pacific. Uh, we do have uh, some wa warmer waters up here. Who's heard of the blob? I'm sure everybody's heard of the blob and they were expecting to hear more about it tonight. I don't have a slide on the blob, um, but the blob is, is really what that refers to is this warmer water up in the North Pacific. And what's happening is that we had this very strong high pressure ridge in the North Pacific that allowed this warm water to, to build up. And the projections are, the numerical projections are that this should break down with time as we go into the winter. The other thing that's happening here is this warm water off of California exceptionally warm water. Um, the surfers are complaining that their, that their uh, wetsuits aren't thin enough because it's too warm. Um, we're getting sea snakes on the beaches. Um, we're getting a uh, higher uh, occurrence of hammerhead sharks. We're getting, uh, let's see, what else? Uh, stingrays. We're getting stingrays in, in Newport Beach. 
So all of this is uh, because of this very warm water. Now the question comes up, are these storms that we've had, like last Thursday, um, we can go back into July and September when we had, we had some big rain events. Those events that we had back in July, um, those were remnants of hurricanes. And it is, it is true that in an El Nino season like this, when we get all of this warm water, that you have a higher frequency of hurricanes within the eastern Pacific. And in fact, we have about three times normal, the, the normal number of hurricanes in the eastern Pacific so far this year. And what happens is that that increases the odds that those hurricanes, as they turn north, <coughs> when they typically run into cold water, now they have this warm water. We had remnants of Hurricane Dolores that produced quite a bit of rain, washed out. When we talk about infrastructure impacts, it washed out uh, the bridge on the I-10, a uh, major thoroughfare um, that goes from west to east. Um, then we also had the remnants of Hurricane Linda that came up and produced quite a bit of rainfall. The rain that occurred last week was uh, um, the Im impact of a low pressure system, which kind of made its way around and rotated around and probably without question was able to feed off of this warm water off of Southern California. It was a very moist system that produced very heavy rainfall and had very dramatic impacts as well. So one of the things about the blob, the blob is starting already to go away. I hate to say it, but it is starting to cool. This is a, a, a graphic that shows the change, weekly change in sea surface temperature anomalies over the last month. So you can see how we are cooling. And we actually, in order to really get this jet stream going through the Pacific, we need this, these cooler waters up here. And the projections, like I said, are for that to eventually break down. <coughs> so what this is, this is that Nino 3.4 SST anomaly. So here's the zero line. This is normal compared to a climatological average. These are warmer than normal. This, this is colder than normal. And here we are right here in the last observation, September, is from the International Research Institute. And, and what it is then is, these, here are these three month running averages, September, October, November, October, November, December. And then these are all different models and the projection of what those temperatures will do. So these are dynamical models here and statistical models. And then you take the average of those, it's simply a, an ensemble, a mean, and this is what it's forecasting. So it's forecasting to increase the, the warming. And then we're, all we're talking about here is that 3.4 region. And warming up to almost 2.5 and then cooling off as we go into the spring. And um, we are in the strong category. This 1.5 to 3.0 is considered strong. Now, as has already been brought up, we've had six previous strong events. The two strongest that really um, on record are 82, 83, 97, 98. So here's how we compare to that. Um, this red line is the, are those temperatures now from 2015. The orange is 97, 98, and the blue, purple is kind of 82, 83. So again, here are these three month running averages. So we're, we're on this July, August, September right here, summer, fall, winter. So we're number two right now. So the projections are for it to almost be as strong from a ocean temperature standpoint as 97, 98. But when you think about what we know happened, and, and I'll, I'm sure we have few, fewer hands if I say who was here at 82, 83. Probably half. <laughs> but I think if you're here both in 82, 83 and 97, 98, you remember what happened. Now, that's not to say that the exact same thing is going to happen this winter. I remember the whole small statistical sample of only six samples. Um, but the, 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 the signal is pretty strong in terms of, of both those events were very similar to what happened in Southern California. Now, this is another way to look at it. Um, this is a NASA satellite, the Topek Poseidon, which actually was, it's now at the end of its life. <coughs> but back in 97, it was, it was collecting data. This is actually the height of the sea surface, and it's an anomaly. So it's, it's um, if you look at the scale down here, this is not temperature, this is millimeters. So this means this white area, 180 millimeters, about seven or eight inches or so, um, above normal. So you have a climatological norm over a period of time. And this is on October 2nd, 1997, this is what it looked like. So very warm uh, area or high area. And now in 2015, October, 
Very similar. The one, there's a minor difference here. So very, very similar, even though there's other, um, there's other parameters that aren't quite as favorable as they were in 97 to 80. I won't, I won't go through those here, but um, it is very, looking very 1997-ish. So when we talk about impacts, uh, precipitation, of course, produces the, the amount of precipitation we could get um, can have uh, quite a bit of impact. And what really stresses the system is when you get um, heavy precipitation in back-to-back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back -to -back days. You know, we can get a lot of these storms that come through here, and they, they come through and they produce some rain over about six hours. Uh, the, there's some impacts, but for the most part, the sun comes out the next day, and we, and, and we can kind of move on. But what stresses the system is when we have these back-to-back. So what this chart is, these, these are 24-hour um, rainfall amounts, downtown Los Angeles. The red is 1982-83, 97-98 is in the purple, between the dates of November 1st and April 30th. What you'll see here is anything above one inch. We average four days between this time period. We average four that are over an inch, so not very many. 82-83, 13, 97-98, 11. So probably three times as many days. And you can see, if you remember uh, back February of 98, uh, we had actually a couple of wet periods in the beginning of February and the end of February. You see how it also peaks in February. That's, that's uh, seasonally, that's when we maximize with our precipitation in Southern California. And El Nino just kind of piles it on. And you can see here's one day in, in 1983, almost three and a half inches of rainfall in downtown Los Angeles. So again, these back-to-back -back storms that really stress the system. On a California perspective, because the question of the drought comes up, will El Nino end the drought? And you saw, okay, that we get maybe 30 inches of rain in 97, 98. We have an accumulated deficit in downtown Los Angeles over the last four years of about 30 inches. So if you add up all the below averages in the last four years, it's about 30 inches. So it's almost an unprecedented four years of drought. And part of, part of helping our drought would be to help the snowpack, would be to help the reservoirs within central and northern California. Back for the last six strong El Ninos, uh, there were two strong El Ninos in which central and northern California did not get above normal precipitation. So these very dark greens in here, this is almost 200% of normal. So 97, 98, 82, 83, both very wet throughout both, all of California. Uh, there was record snowpack in the Sierras in 82, 83. Now, you may ask yourself, well, then that would be the drought. That would be it. We'd be over. But it takes more than one season. Unfortunately, much of that rain washes away into the ocean in its, in its runoff. What we need, actually, are multiple seasons of, of rebuilding that snowpack. It would, make, it would make a big difference, of course, but rebuilding that snowpack, refilling those reservoirs, and helping to replenish our groundwater. Um, so the official forecast... And um, if, the way to read these things is we start out at the tercile, so you start out with a 33% chance of below normal, 33 normal, 33 above normal. And then the Climate Prediction Center, NOAA's Climate Prediction Center, adjusts those numbers. So if you see down here greater than 50%, then that's actually a pretty strong signal for 50%, ch greater than 50% chance of above normal rainfall, almost double the tercile. So this is for December, January, February. And then just stepping through January, February, March, now you see this, this February signal here in Southern California and Arizona, dry up in the Pacific Northwest, and then finally February, March, April. So it's, it's the Climate Prediction Center um, really showing, you know, probably double the chances now of, of above normal precipitation uh, for that January, February, March. So some of the impacts, and you'll see more details of this here in the next couple of talks. Multiple impacts, especially from January to March, and assuming that if we do get above normal rainfall and if we do get a higher number of, of, of storms through this winter, uh, coastal erosion, large wave action, rip currents, uh, of course the flooding concerns, especially when you get back storms on two to three day periods because you need that, those soils to saturate so the water can then run off and that's where you get flooding. You have flash flooding, of course. You can get flash flooding, it doesn't even have to be an El Nino year. You get flash flooding. And we, we see what flash flooding can bring uh, with what we just saw on the I-5 and the 58 and everywhere last week. Um, and, and then with debris flows, recent burn areas, 
our live fuel moistures in Los Angeles County, in Ventura County, really throughout all of Southern California, despite all the rain we got last week, are still at critical levels. So we're still in high fire season. Uh, the, the long range models will, they kind of bounce around in the long range a little bit. And, and there have been a couple of times that it has teased us with a, a strong Santa Ana event. So we have to remember we're still in October. And if we do get fires in burn areas, now we bring the potential for debris flows. And uh, we do have a couple of uh, fairly recent burn areas, 18 months since the Colby burn area near Glendora. Uh, we're still monitoring that. There's still that potential for debris flows above Glendora. Uh, the Springs burn area in Camarillo, we also have to watch that. We need to watch these burn areas for about five years. It takes that long for the vegetation to grow back. And the Colby burn area is only about 65% growth back right now. So it's not all the way. So you get these debris flows, like what happened on, in locking out a Flint Ridge and down Ocean View, that can be very disastrous and very deadly. So those are the things that we really have to kind of keep an eye on. So just in summary, uh, strong El Nino persisting. Um, the perfect political answer that can't go wrong is that El Nino tilts the odds. <laughs> <clears throat> I think I have to give this kind of like this. It tilts the odds for rainfall in Southwest California this winter. Um, and the past strong El Nino events that have been recorded have produced well above average precipitation in Southern California. That's all I have to say. I, I need to leave you with a, with a safety message. We just, uh, we can't forget to turn around, don't drown. It's, it, seems, it seems simple, but when we get a lot of rain and people ask us, okay, what should we do? There's some real simple things you can do when you're driving on the freeways to really help yourself and help people around you. Leave room between you and the car in front of you. Uh, check your wipers. Make sure you have good visibility. Slow down a little bit. And whatever you do, don't turn, you know, turn around, don't drown, because there are far too many fatalities um, on, through flooded roadways and, and not turning around and thinking that you can go through this water. Um, we are, I'll give a shameless plug here as long as I'm here. Um, you can check us out on Twitter, um, weather.gov slash Los Angeles uh, for our website and on Facebook. And my hope is that if we do get a lot of rain this winter, that our infrastructure, our communication technology that we have, our observing technology that we have now that we didn't have in 97, 98, and the way that, at least from a weather service perspective, that we communicate with our partners and that we can let them know ahead of time, the emergency managers, public works, fire agencies, you know, a week in, in advance that we have something big coming up here next week. And the more that with technology and that our numerical weather prediction is now improved, the more they can be prepared so that they're not reacting. They're not just reacting, they're being proactive and they're getting ready even before these storms hit. So hopefully, hopefully we can all be ready and as you as individuals can do something simple like this to help save yourself. Okay? Thank you. Thanks, Mark. And you heard them. The odds are tilted uh, <laughs> better than 50% uh, chance that we're going to see significant rainfall here in Southern California. So with, with that, are we prepared? I mean, you know, do we have adequate uh, infrastructure? Um, you know, and with that, I'm going to bring up Russell Boudreau um, and have him chat a little bit about that. Great. Well, thank you and good evening all. So El Nino, 1516, what are we in for? Uh, a coastal engineering viewpoint. And so... <coughs> This is kind of what I'd like to kind of cover tonight. Um, first, coastal engineering. What, is, what does coastal engineering do? And, and as coastal engineers, we try to solve problems where land and water meet. I'll talk about how we then quantify our environment. And we'll try to learn from recent El Ninos to see what we might be in store for and what we need to plan for for this coming year. And then talk about some future challenges, including you know, may, what may be in store in terms of not just El Nino, but uh, climate change. So coastal engineering, a lot of you may not be familiar with coastal engineering. It's kind of like a subset or discipline within civil engineering. And it's a, 
I'll just describe it. It's, or it's defined as coastal engineering is a study of the natural processes ongoing at the shoreline and construction within the coastal zone. The field involves aspects of nearshore oceanography, marine geology, and civil engineering, often directed at combating erosion of coasts or providing navigation access. Now, there's a lot of other things that coastal engineers do, but tonight I'm really going to be focusing on this issue of combating erosion of the coasts. So as a coastal engineer, how do we quantify our environment to try to solve a problem? Whereas a soils engineer will look at soil types and liquefaction, things like that. As a coastal engineer, we're interested in the tides. The tides are driven by the pull of the moon and the sun. But there's other things that also affect the water level besides tides, and those will be important, and I'll talk about those. Um, ocean waves are important, and actually what I don't have listed on here is wind, because uh, Wind creates waves, wind waves anyway, um, what we coastal engineers call gravity waves. Um, ocean waves can also be created by movements of land. Tsunamis can be created by earthquakes and underwater landslides, things like that. Currents and then literal processes. What that is is the movement of sediment by waves and currents. And then if you get that moving away from a shoreline, we could be subjected to coastal erosion, which as you'll see on some of my slides later, uh, with coastal erosion, infrastructure, property is subjected to potential significant damage. So as, as engineers, we try to learn from, from the past and solve problems going forward. And so uh, um, fortunately, engineers, from their past experience, we like to learn from them and share our experiences and pass those on. So either through conferences and things like that, this is an example of of some recent uh, journals of a coastal engineering journal. And uh, this top one here was published in uh, July of 1998 after the, uh, that winter special issue, the fury of El Nino. And so some of the things I talk about this evening or were facts and things taken from articles such as this. So the first El Nino I'm going to talk about, these are lessons learned to carry forward, is the El Nino 1982-1983. So the first thing about that was it had warm water, just like we were talking about. And I was around in 1982-1983, and I remember because the summer of 1982, I'm an avid water person, I was out sailing offshore, right off um, Long Beach, and we sailed by and there was a couple of sea turtles right there. I've never seen a sea turtle off Long Beach. And I was aware that the water was warm. So that was the first indication. You heard a lot about the ENSO, Southern Oscillation El Nino. And that winter, there was a one foot increase in the still water levels. Um, plus, there was an atmospheric low stationary off Hawaii. So for those of us that like winter sports, too, for example, like going up to Mammoth in the wintertime, sometimes we'll go, where well, are we going to get some fresh snow? And so we'll look at the weather map up in the Gulf of Alaska, and if there's some low pressures up there, you know, chances are that we may get some snow down here. So we're interested in that. But with this low off of Hawaii, what was happening is it was bringing those low pressures and those storm cells down, and it, you could see that in Mark's, Mark's slide coming in more from the west. And so instead of the storms coming from the north, they came in more from the west. And so as a result of that, there was more open ocean for the winds to blow over. And for ocean waves to get big, it's controlled by three things. How hard the wind is blowing, over how, what time period it blows, and over what area. So we had these huge fetches, big wind, big storms. We had big waves. And so when I say, more southerly approach direction, just instead of northwest, these waves were coming in from the west. So now let's look at the context of where we are. The Southern California Bight from Point Conception down to San Diego pretty much faces southwest. I mean, right here in Long Beach, we've got more of a southern exposure, but that's the general um, exposure of the area. So as you see, for waves that come from a typical winter, they're coming from this area. And so waves would bend, as we call refract, and they would lose energy as they turn the corner and bend. And so through wave refraction, which is similar to light refraction, as these waves have to turn the corner, due to like conservation of energy, these wave crests, as they spread out and turn the corner, the wave heights go down because the crests spread out as they bend around. Well, 
if the waves are coming straight in, they don't refract as much. And so you get bigger wave heights coming right into the shoreline. And that was the case of a lot of the storms during that winter time. So let's talk about, you know, Mark had talked about a season of storms. Well, 82, 83 was a real season of storms. This is only the, the top four, and there's some, some interesting things about this. First, each one of these before that winter would have been considered a 100-year storm. So statistically, you know, well, we had a 100-year storm last month. We can't have another one. Well, you can. It's just statistics. So, so you have these really big storms, and these all clustered together. And these are just the big ones. There were, as you saw in Mark's plot, a lot of other storms. So then let's talk about the wave height. You know, you look at the ocean, and you see, well, it's not just a constant wave train of the same wave heights. There's waves that are bigger, smaller, different wave periods come from different directions. So how do oceanographers or engineers define a sea state in terms of wave height? Well, they figured probably the easiest way to do it, and that's become a standard, is they measure the significant wave height. So they measure a series of waves, they take the highest third of those and they take an average, and that describes that sea state. That's called the significant wave height. So the March storm, for example, had a significant wave height of almost 24 feet. But that's just the significant wave height. Statistically, the largest wave is almost double that. So that tells us that we had, you know, waves on the order of 50 feet, you know, in that, in, for that storm. And as you can see going on down, um, pretty good size. With all this energy and these waves, you know, blowing over this open ocean, not only do you get big wave heights, you get long wave periods and long wavelengths. So look at some of these wave periods. I mean, if you, if you surf or you fish and you're out in the ocean, you know, some of these winter storms that come, you know, you got 12, 13, 15 second period. Well, some of these storms were, you know, 20, 21, 22 seconds. So think about this. If you're on a pier and you get a big wave coming and the crest goes by, set your stopwatch. 22 seconds later is when the next crest comes by. So these wave lengths are really, of course, that's in deep water, but really, really long. And the longer the wavelength, the deeper down in the ocean the energy goes. So these waves were very, very energetic. So that's another element about that winter. And as I said before, instead of coming in from 290, 300 on the compass, these waves were coming in like from, from due west. So there you go. There's an example. That's a 100-foot yacht trying to get out of the entrance at Morro Bay. So you can just get some idea of what the size of that wave was. OK, now I got a little video here for you. Sure. Then The collapse anyways, of a portion of the historic Santa Monica Pier after high tides and raging surf ripped the coastal areas of Southern California. Channel 5. Reporting from Jetcopter 5. The storm hit the coastline with a vengeance, leaving thousands of longtime residents racking their memories, trying to recall if they had ever experienced such violent weather. Few could. Heavy damage all the way from Malibu into Orange County, with several landmarks taking a particular pounding. The surf that accompanied this morning's high tide caused major damage to the famed Santa Monica Pier. The lower level was almost completely torn away, and topside there was heavy structural damage. For a while, it looked like the Santa Monica Pier would be completely washed away. The parking lot became a lake. Officials evacuated the few people on it from the pier and then kept everyone away. It became a game of wait and see. What the storm... Okay, so now, can I go to the next one? This is Malibu. Bottom line. Okay, so I don't have that in front of me, but that's okay. So, so we saw a lot of damage right there. Was it just, just the waves or what else was going on in 1982-83? Well, one thing that was unique about that winter 
was extraordinary coincidence between the height of the storms occurring within one hour of the highest astronomical tide, that was in the November storm, or the second highest tide of the year in the January storm. So just bad, bad luck having these big, big storms happen right at the highest tides of the year. That was a big problem. The low barometric pressure also contributed to a, a elevated sea level, high onshore winds, and, and heavy rain and runoff certainly contributed to the, uh, to the damage and the flooding. So why is water level real important when it comes to the shoreline? Well, when you get close to the shoreline, the maximum wave that can break is limited by the water depth. Roughly, a wave can break in about the same water depth. So when, if you've got three feet of water against a seawall, you got about a maximum wave height of three feet. So anyways, here's an example of a coastal seawall. This is actually down in, in uh, Mission Beach, where this is just a typical example of wave breaking on a, a structure with a high water level, but not real deep sand scour. And so the sea level, the seawall does just fine. It doesn't flood, there's no damage. But let's look at the 1983 conditions. The sand is washed away from erosion. You got an elevated sea level. All of a sudden you got a wave high, you got a water level at the seawall like 10 feet. And so you can get a very, very large wave that caused a tremendous amount of flooding and overtopping um, in addition to some damage. So uh, this water levels are real, real important. And like, for example, for you civil engineers, you know, wind loads goes up to the square of the velocity. In other words, if the wind, I, in other words, the force goes up with the velocity squared. With ocean waves, the, the force of the wave goes up to the cube of the wave height. And so, for example, if the, the wave height increases by 25%, the forces related with that wave almost double. So uh, water level is very, very important along the shoreline for these. And so that's that's example of that, that what I just depicted earlier. The top of that seawall is at plus 18 above the low tide level. And so with that elevated water, that water just coming right over the top of that. Again, that's in down in Mission Beach. So what's the aftermath? of the 82, 83 storms. Some of the areas um, from San Francisco all the way down to San, San Diego, almost you know, 150, 185 feet of sandy shoreline lost. A lot of that sand just moved offshore. It gradually moved back, not fully restored the beaches, but beaches did come back. Santa Barbara Harbor filled up with 300,000 cubic yards of sand, completely closed the harbor, and a lot of damages. And I'll, uh, acknowledge that those were 1984 dollars and those damages actually I, I just recently looked today that that's about half of what they really were so a um, little bit low and also what what the 1983 storms did to change our design criteria with that concurrence of high tides and high waves basically the coastal engineering community said look from now on we got to consider the fact that these two can happen at the same time so now what about 1997-1998? Another uh, major El Nino winter. You know, that's probably fresher in more of our minds and certainly was all I remember is rain, rain, rain. Um, but it wasn't um, as severe as 82-83 in terms of least coastal damage. And, and, and why is that? What well, could be that some of the more marginal structures were winnowed out in the 82-83 storms that were destroyed, structures replaced, um, was sturdier construction, again, using better design criteria. Some of the structures, like some of the coastal piers, just weren't, weren't rebuilt. Um, the wave heights were lower. And the big thing, at least in my mind, is you didn't have the storms happening at the same, tide of these same time of these really high tides. So this is, I remember this well. In fact, as an aside, I had twin boys born that winter, and so people were joking me about what's going to be worse, El Nino or Los Ninos, you know. <laughs> I still haven't figured that out, but. So this was actually before, this was actually, we had a tropical storm and an extra tropical storm happen at the same time, and Seal Beach really got flooded, and this was in September of 1997. Now this is up in Malibu, I have, that. this needs no caption. <laughs> And then again, another picture of 1997, 1998 up in, up in Malibu, up at Broad Beach. So I've talked a little bit about sandy shorelines, but particularly down in uh, um, San Diego County, for example, you got more coastal bluffs. 
And so what about waves breaking on coastal bluffs? Well, there's good and bad. Um, as you have probably gathered, sand is an important resource. Um, if you've got a wide sandy beach, you've got a buffer uh, against wave attack on your shoreline. So if you don't have much sand, then you're, you're not as good off. So sand is an important resource. Um, coastal bluffs, they erode, and they introduce sand into the sediment budget, if you will. So that's the, the plus side. The downside of coastal bluff erosion is oftentimes there's things on top of the bluff. And so as you can imagine, and you're probably aware, there's a lot of problems, litigation, mitigation issues, as people try to armor the toe of the bluffs to keep them from eroding to protect their home or highway, things like that. But uh, at what cost? Because they're holding that sand back that maybe is the rights of everybody. OK, let's get to 2015, 2016. I'm a little bit concerned because beaches are a little bit narrower than they were back in the last El Ninos, at least on a few projects I'm working on. Actually, water levels are already running high. And again, as we know, if we get high waves and tides combined with big rain this winter, it can be a recipe for problems. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about sea level rise. We talk about El Nino where it's coming. You've seen the plots. Well, it's kind of really already here. This is tides predicted and measured at LA Outer Harbor. The blue comes right out of your tide tables or your tide calendar, things like that. Um, you just look it up, and these are the highs per day. The orange is what's actually being measured there. So again, we talk about this rise in sea level. Look at very recently, that's actually a foot of difference. So right now, the tides, the water levels are running up to a foot higher than predicted. So for example, next week, we got a pretty high tide coming up. Pay attention, because areas that usually flood, they're going to flood more than they usually do. We've got some areas that are vulnerable right now. That's Marine Stadium um, in Long Beach. And that's on Pacific Coast Highway on the right. Um, in Sunset Beach that already floods, and so that's going to be a real challenge for them this winter. Now, this is about El Nino. I want to just bring up real briefly, because we're also aware about discussions about climate change and sea level rise, and I was at a, a conference down at Scripps Institution of Oceanography a couple months ago talking about this very thing, and they said that, well, what they want to do with this winter is kind of use it as a, as a proxy for what the new normal might be in the future. Because as we're projecting rising sea levels, right now for 2030, if it goes on the high projected, we could have sea level raised a foot overall um, by 2030. Or if it just goes the middle projected by 2050. So what they're saying is maybe let's experience this, this winter as maybe being representative of the new normal in the future. In other words, because this is going to be a high water level this winter that will probably go away next year. But this could be the new normal going forward. So they just want to look at it, well, this could be the new normal. And just real briefly, we are doing some work for the city of Huntington Beach, looking at areas that are going to be prone to flooding at high water levels. So this is just with one foot, which is what we're seeing now. So at a high tide in the Huntington Harbor area and Sunset Beach, already potential for flooding. And if we had two feet, more and more flooding inland, and particularly you know, upland on some of these flood control channels, again, but then what you, you would do at that point is revisit the height of the levees and things such as that. So things can be done, but based upon what infrastructure is there now, if we had two feet of sea level rise, it could be problematic. So what, 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 what to do? This is kind of like the wrap up. What can communities do um, to prepare? Obviously, a wide sandy beach is a good natural buffer against erosion. So maintaining your beach, adding sand to the beach, for example, a seal beach does is a good idea. Building a sand dike, make, putting more sand out there, it doesn't solve the problem, but it's an extra sacrificial buffer of sand that the waves can work on instead of working on the, you know, people's homes and the and infrastructure. So what beach nourishment does is moves the threat seaward. The other op option is to hold the line by putting a seawall in or shore protection. There's a lot of pushback on that from the Coastal Commission. Other areas are accommodated just by let it flood and let the water go through your first floor. 
you know, and just do it that way and make sure your, your property or whatever is structurally sound to do that. And that, that, help, that happens elsewhere. Some places that's all they can do. Or retreat. So those are the various options that are, that are available to, uh, to folks going forward. So um, there's some very useful uh, resources available um, for data. One of the things to keep an eye on through this Coastal Data Information Program, I like this flooding index because it looks at both water level and waves, and as we go forward, we're gonna see some, some higher predictions than that. So anyways, look at these as well. The SCOOS website and the NOAA Digital Coast, I found to be pretty useful. So this closing remark is actually for my colleague at the National Weather Service. He didn't want to you know, step out and make a, <laughs> a commitment on that, and so I go, well, you know, it's hard. It's hard to predict, particularly about the future. So uh, you know, <laughs> little levity, Mark. And speaking of levity, um, you know, El Nino is, is serious business, and I know that. And you know, there's threat of life, um, threat of property damage, things such as that. Um, and I'm aware of that, but I also like to inject levity into my presentations. And so as a final slide, we can just bow to El Nino. I am El Nino. <laughs> All other tropical storms must bow before El Nino. <laughs> Yo soy El Nino. For those of you who don't habla Espanol, El Nino is Spanish for the Nino. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Russell, and uh, for those uh, coastal considerations. And, and now I'd like to bring up Kevin Bryan to talk more, a little bit more about infrastructure. Kevin? Well, uh, I want to say, first of all, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. I'm, I'm actually a geologist. Uh, I feel kind of like I snuck in the room a little bit with all these engineers. Uh, I'm an engineering geologist, so I think that's how I snuck in under the radar. Uh, I'm actually a consultant. Uh, I work for a large uh, environmental and geotechnical consulting firm that's been in Southern California for 54 years. So we, uh, as a company and as a firm, have seen uh, many of the infrastructure pieces go in in Southern California, but also repaired uh, many of the damages that El Nino have, have uh, wrought in Southern California. Um, I, I chuckled a little bit in that uh, as going forth, I feel like I'm kind of batting cleanup for, for those of you that know baseball. And, you know, fairly apropos for this, uh, this discussion. So um, what, I, what I'd like to talk about when I get a chance here, what I'm going to talk about is um, more of a, a, a tying a little bit of um, what the, my, my colleagues in the panel have discussed, um, discuss, fill in a few a little bit of the pieces, and then talk a little bit more about um, policy and, and how we get uh, stormwater infrastructure in Southern California, what drives that, and, and where we are with the, with the coming El Nino with regard to stormwater and our stormwater infrastructure. Um, I just push forward. It doesn't go. Okay. So I, I already discussed a little bit about our company. Um, we're we're in Southern California. Um, we've been around for 54 years, um, anywhere from Ventura County all the way down to San Diego. Uh, what drives stormwater infrastructure in Southern California? Uh, mostly is policy, and, uh, and the press, to a great de degree, drives that. What makes policy? Um, press makes policy. Um, I thought these were, were um, kind of funny in light of what we were talking about, in that um, we've had record rainfall, wreaks havoc on Southern California roads, more than two inches of rain in downtown San Diego in September, which would make it the third wettest September uh, storm since the 1870s. This is all during a drought, mind you. Um, one month later, almost exactly, mudslides bury the Highway 5 and five feet of uh, debris from a debris flow. Um, over 3.38 inches of rain fell in one hour with 1.8 inches falling in a half an hour. If you can imagine that, it's go outside in your front yard and put the hose on your head. I mean, that's a lot of water coming down at one time. One month later, or five days later, the, the press puts LA getting no Owens Valley runoff for the first time since 1913. So we're getting a bit of a press whiplash about weather. Well, we're getting um, predictions and, and uh, very detailed predictions about El Nino coming. We're still in a drought, and from one headline to the next, it's too much water, not enough water, um, and how do, we, how do we deal with that? Um, the effects of El Nino uh, have, in 1997, 98, and, and I'd like to ask real quick, like my colleagues, 
Who was born after 1964? After 1964. Quite a few hands in here, and that'll be important in a minute here. Um, the effects of El, El Nino in 1997, 1998 was, is fairly well documented. Um, five or six events prior um, in El Nino, um, not a lot of, of changes made into the infrastructure. The infrastructure in this, in this basin, in, this, uh, in the coastal plain in which we live, um, Santa Ana River uh, Basin, the San Gabriel River Basin covers almost 3,000 square miles. Goes through Riverside, San Bernardino, Orange, and uh, LA County. So it's a, one of the most extremely complex stormwater environments and, and infrastructure environments that we work in. Uh, it, you can imagine the number of agencies and the number of uh, regulatory um, agencies and cities and counties that have to deal with that system as a whole uh, to develop and manage their stormwater systems. One of my colleagues th talked about um, particulate matter uh, and weather. We talked about the fires in Southern California. I brought this up because I, I wanted to um, bring it up in light of uh, dealing with El Nino storms and dealing with uh, flash flooding and debris flow. Nine of the 20 largest wildfires that have ever been recorded in California occurred uh, since the year 2000. So we have a lot of wildland, wildland edge space that has debris, has loose soil, has somewhat grown back, but in some of these cases, in some of the, the habitats we have, uh, coastal oak, live oak, um, manzanita, takes tens of years to grow back to full, um, full things. So we have lots of areas um, since the last 97, 98 El Nino that were completely denuded by, by tremendous fires. So, I talked a little just briefly about um, stormwater management issues when I say it's extremely complex. Most of the backbone systems uh, in LA and Orange County were built in the 30s and 40s. Um, it's the, one of the fastest growing, it's the largest metropolitan area in the nation and the fastest, if you take it as a whole, one of the fastest growing uh, population wise since World War II. We have the post-World War II industrial complex and, and development in LA, which created a tremendous amount of paved area, impervious concrete, um, and paved areas which cause rainwater uh, to, run, to be running um, directly into neighborhoods, directly onto streets. So stormwater systems and infrastructure were designed to get that water as quickly as possible to the ocean. Um, not to infiltrate the ground, not to store, not to uh, use for other reasons. It was get it offshore as fast as possible. And so that was the design element was how fast can we get this rainwater out of here. Um, what comes with the development, uh, especially when it comes to stormwater, is uh, debris, um, trash, um, plastic being the number one now, and, and most of it single-use disposable trash, whether it's uh, um, to-go containers, plastic cups, plastic bags, um, which clog storm drains and clog uh, infrastructure that was put in uh, 40, 50, 60 years ago uh, and not designed for some of the uh, expanded development we have now. Another thing to bring up is as we move away from our, our industrial um, uh, machine that, that kind of supported World War II, we have a legacy of chemicals uh, and, and concerns in soil and groundwater that with our paved environment is easily washed into the, into the storm drain and quickly out to the ocean. And um, I'll talk a little bit about how we can manage some of that. So what is the cost? Uh, why is this important when we talk about stormwater uh, and flooding? And some of the pictures we saw uh, shown um, in some of the previous colleagues' um, um, displays were a flooding of, of either industrial or commercial areas or flooding along coastal areas or flooding in the inland valleys along rivers, the Santa Ana, the San Gabriel, things like that. This is a, from a 2010 report from FEMA, and FEMA does a, a um, insurance risk maps. They're called firms, but they also do uh, some estimating for risk based on the 100 and 500 year storms. We talked a little bit about what does that mean? What is a 100 year storm? Doesn't mean it's the largest storm that could happen in 100 years. There's a 1% chance or one in 100 that that storm could happen in any given year. That can happen twice in a year. That can happen three times in a year. Um, the same with the 500 year storm. It's, it's one in 500 or 0.2% chance. So what does that mean? Why is that important to our infrastructure? Well, uh, if you look at some of the numbers at the bottom, FEMA has estimated that the most um, m highest risk counties in the state of California for damage to, to both um, structures and their contents, but also populations and impact are orange in Los Angeles, um, and that's based on flood levels and flood control. 
If you look uh, when it comes to structural risk, how many actual structures and, and facilities are at risk from the 100 or 500 year storm? You see that it's Santa Clara orange, but Los Angeles a close third. So we are at the highest risk uh, for, for monetary damage from both a structural and contents and a population um, issue. And those numbers are uh, for the 100 year flood are 35.7 billion. Um, we're in the tens to, to hundreds of billions of dollars for risk when you count both counties uh, together. So what can we do right now? Uh, as a geologist, I tend to look much longer term um, sometimes in, than my engineering colleagues. Um, you know, I'm used to looking at big, long time scales. I asked who was born after 1964. The reason I asked that is because large infrastructure projects for stormwater are decades long. Uh, and they're funded over decades. And so um, when I was asked by Matt, you know, to speak a little bit about what is the effect of El Nino on our infrastructure? Well, you know, I don't know how to say this, not a whole lot um, on, on what we're going to do immediately with our infrastructure because we, it's, we're going to kind of deal with what we have. We have infrastructure and it is what it is right now. I bring up 1964 because in 1964 uh, there was a program that was um, – proposed called the Santa, Santa Ana River Program, or project, Santa Ana River Project. It was proposed in 1964. It was approved in 1989. So there was a few years in between, and that was, that was partly caused by the 1957 El Nino event. They didn't call it El Nino then, but um, the rains that we saw with tremendous flooding in Huntington Beach. The Santa Ana River Project is slated. It, it includes the Seven Oaks Dam, which is completed now in the upper reaches of the Santa Ana River. Uh, the Prado Dam, which is um, owned and operated by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, um, that's been raised recently. It's been expanded a little bit as part of the Santa Ana River program. So imagine 1964, you say, we're going to upgrade some of our, our stormwater infrastructure, and it's slated to be completed in 2020. So it's, it's you know, it doesn't happen overnight because an El Nino is being, the news is saying, El Nino, El Nino, El Nino, let's fix our infrastructure. These programs are multi-decade program sometimes. And what drives them is uh, somewhat the press. Um, as scientists and engineers, we drive the process. We get the data. We collect the data. The better we collect the data, the better we can um, estimate and, and, uh, and predict to some degree what's going to happen in the future, um, the more we can drive the process of being able to pay for this pl these plans that come up. Um, but what can we do immediately? Um, we can clear our detention basins, um, drains, channels, uh, inlets, and, and not only on a city and county by county basis, but also in a neighborhood by neighborhood basis. Um, each of us can do this. Uh, you'd be surprised how much um, it adds up when you think about small channels in your yard, behind your yard, in your neighborhood that are clogged by debris, um, yard trimmings, uh, trash that's in your neighborhood. If that can be cleaned up, that makes a big difference at the end of the pipe. Um, we can do inspections and prioritization of the facilities we already have, the storm uh, drain facilities we already have. Um, like I said, many of our backbone uh, stormwater facilities and, and infrastructure was built in the 30s and 40s. So you can imagine as we've expanded towards the mountains, uh, what type of capacity we're looking at in some of these. And it's been a lot of Band-Aids uh, and it's worked, uh, but we discussed um, earlier it will depend this year if the El Nino strikes and hits like we think it may, as it's uh, predicted, depends on the intensity, the duration, and how they're spaced. Um, we are designed for 100-year floods. I mean, the engineering behind the storm drain system we have is good, um, but it will depend, of course, on how, how much uh, water comes, how fast it comes, and how often it comes. Um, timely repair of damaged facilities. Uh, we've had four years of drought. There's not a real impetus for a lot of cities and counties to, to push to fix or repair things where we don't have any water. It's not raining. We have other issues. Um, but as I showed earlier on the, on the FEMA map, that can be a costly mistake. They're very expensive. We can make improvements to existing structures, and uh, we can in, um, inspect and enforce the current stormwater laws and regulations. Uh, there's a tendency to, to, to be a little bit softer on enforcement of in placement of BMPs or trash TMDLs, uh, total maximum daily loads, things like that when we're four or five years into a, a drought because we're not seeing how those BMPs are making a big difference. And so um, that's very important. What can we do in the future? Uh, we can, I, I say social engineering because I think as engineers and scientists, the math, the data, we can design using those, that information. Um, 
at the bottom of this slide, I want to jump down. LADPW uh, produced a stormwater capture master plan. It was approved by the Regional Quality Control Board two days ago. It's a plan that, outli that outlines uh, a series of um, steps and facilities to capture the stormwater and re-infiltrate it into the ground. There's spreading basins, there's detention basins, uh, but it's a plan. There's no source of funding. There's no you know, uh, documented way that that can be paid for yet, but it's a plan, and a lot of the information we gather drives the planning process. We, as scientists and engineers, have to drive the, the policy side of it and make the people pay for those um, facilities. We have to pay for those facilities. So what can we do um, social engineering-wise? We can require uh, our cities and counties to drive low-impact development, fantastic engineering, Many things are coming out now with pervious pavements, bioswales, um, green space, uh, infiltration of stormwater uh, that helps not only the storm impact when it comes to flooding, but also to cleaning and environmental issues that are in the rainwater and stormwater that gets driven. Continue to educate and uh, drive regulation regarding trash and plastic in particular. Um, there's a lot of studies locally. Uh, there's a, a group called the Al Algalita Foundation uh, Captain Moore driving um, a lot of studies and research about plastic in, in uh, rainwater, which ends up in the ocean, and how that drives um, um, chemicals such as organochlorine pesticides and uh, rodenticides and fertilizers that are come along with the trash and the plastic debris. Include infrastructure upgrades and capital improvement plans. We have to pay it forward. We're going to have to have. We're going to have to drive with our vote and also with our data and our engineering. Um, these small improvements to these large systems have to be funded in city and county capital improvement plans, rather than pushing it out uh, to wait for the next El Nino to happen. So, um, the more they change, the more they stay the same. Uh, we talked about this a little bit. Um, as a consultant, I've also been involved in a number of um, infrastructure repairs that really hamper our ability to move, uh, um, you know, um, produce production and things around our country, especially in Southern California. Um, Highway 5 was a great example uh, of how it can, a small, that's a relatively small event from one storm, blocked Highway 5 for three or four days. Uh, that's tens of millions of dollars of commerce that was parked on a highway that, that leads north and south. So. Uh, what we're going to see, I think, this year, if, if the predictions are true, is we'll see the same areas flooding. We'll see the same issues and the same roadways. But I think what will be different is the models and the data that we're collecting now, um, and much finer and much more detailed, allow us to manage the systems we have uh, in a much better way, in a much more efficient way by pre-positioning uh, equipment, uh, by closing roads that we know may flood when we know an event's coming uh, due to the prediction. So, um, some of the pictures I've shown here are uh, Ortega Highway when SR-74 was closed after 97, 98. Uh, highway 5, the, the top right, that's Highway 5 near Pyramid Lake. Ten miles, five miles from the same place that we just had issue. We know that area is prone to, prone to debris flow and mudslides. Um, have we changed the infrastructure? We haven't because it's tens and tens of millions of dollars to build things that we may or may not need for two more cycles of El Nino or maybe not at all. And so uh, what the predictions allow us to do is manage that infrastructure and make smart decisions with the money we do have. That's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, again, I want to give a round uh, of applause to our, our panelists here for, for coming out and lighting us. Because I didn't do a good job moderating you guys. I, we have time for just a couple questions. So if, any questions out there? Yeah. question is for Pamela. Um, you spoke about the aerosols. Um, what is the purpose of the aerosols? We've been seeing the aerosol sprays going on day and night over our skies in California. And uh, I know that they contain heavy amounts of aluminum, barium, and lithium. And aluminum is um, highly flammable and has a drying effect. Um, what is the purpose of the aerosols? Who's flying these planes that are um, spraying the aerosols? And um, does that have an uh, effect on our California drought? So, okay. So what I what um, the aerosols that I was talking about there are actually 
Um, not the type of aerosols that, that you would be talking about, but more like dust, um, natural aerosols is what I'm talking about. So, so things like dust that's blowing from the Gobi Desert, um, aerosols are also smoke from fires, um, different constituents like that in the atmosphere. So when it comes to the satellite, satellite monitoring, it's more like natural phenomena. So um, I actually can't because those I I don't know about those areas. Um, I'm not no engineering or heart, anything like that. Never heard of them before. <coughs> Not yeah, an order for the National Weather Service about speaking about those issues? No, I haven't actually heard about that. Yeah. So we can. Any other questions? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my question for uh, Kevin. Right what are the ways to uh, yeah. protect the rain on El Nino on a short term basis? On a short on a short term basis, um, there are a number of, of different agencies that are actually providing rainwater drums. If you want to collect them at your house, uh, on a large scale, uh, we have spreading basins uh, placed throughout many of the counties, um, which allow the water to the some of the rainwater, not a very large percentage, but some of the rainwater to be diverted into these spreading basins to recharge our groundwater uh, aquifers. Uh, Orange County gets about a half, a third to half of their water from groundwater through wells. So uh, on a regional scale, we try to divert as much of that as possible. Um, Prado Dam has large spreading basins. Uh, what happens in an El Nino um, type event typically is we, we get a lot of sediment that flows down the rivers and, and the drains uh, early in the, in the events and that tends to clog the settling basins. They get, imagine a, a big fine uh, silty clay at the bottom of the, of the, that settles into the settling basin. So if the storms are spread far enough apart, those basins can be cleaned and then ready for the next rain event. If the storms come one after another after another, uh, they tend to divert the water from the spreading basins into the main channel and out to the ocean. So uh, we haven't done a really good job of collecting rainwater uh, in California. Um, that's that's that policy is changing. Um, it's changing, uh, at least at the planning phase. Um, the LADPW plan that was just approved by the regional board, uh, one of its main constituents is, is development of several large uh, spreading basins to recharge for rainwater. Uh, good information uh, that I got here, but how do you get all this information to, as you mentioned, to the news media so that they can maybe provide public service announcements to, to communicate some of this information? Okay. <laughs> well, you're talking, okay. Okay. Right. So, okay, so public safety information. Um, there's, there's actually quite a few ways that we try to get that information out to people. Um, social media is a powerful way to communicate that. Uh, the news media, you know, we've, we've actually, with the exception of public service announcements, and, and we've, you know, public service announcements are, they're not easy. I mean, you, you have to go to them with something ready to go that they can just plug in and play. You have to worry about sweeps week and everything else. And so it's, it's not as easy as it might seem on the surface. But we've definitely had some ideas for public service announcements, and I think that that's something that we should really kind of reinvigorate here as we go into the winter. Um, but, you know, the news media itself, just by talking to us, asking us these exact kind of questions, what can people do? You know, what are you expecting? What can people do? You know, and that's, it's a good way to, for us to kind of send that message. And, you know, we try to do the best job we can by getting out to outreach events. Um, you know, we've got, uh, We've got the uh, Aquarium of the Pacific NOAA Day coming up on November 14th. Come on out to the aquarium and, and hear all about NOAA. And, and you know, we're, we're doing the best we can. And, um, and I think that it's these blue sky, kind of the blue sky type of outreach that we try to practice. That, and just by coming out here and talking to this group of people, hopefully there's been at least something, some takeaways that people can, can get from hearing everything here. Thank you.